When Xerox machines first came out about 30 years ago, they revolutionized the way we handle paper. Little did we know that about 30 years later, the same basic technology would evolve into the laser printer, which has revolutionized the way we use PCs. For fast, quiet, high-quality print, there's no substitute for a laser printer. The question is, which one should you buy? We'll try to help you answer that question today as we take a look at laser printers on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schiffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, I have some examples here of printed documents, the kinds of things normally you think you have to go to a printer and pay a lot of money to get, but these were all created on a personal computer. More importantly, they were all printed out on a laser printer. Now, when we talk about laser printers, we think of desktop publishing right away. Is that the only reason to go out and buy a laser printer? Well, Stuart, really, laser printers and high-resolution graphics go hand in hand. In the case of desktop publishing, the fonts themselves are the graphics you're reproducing. Other examples, presentation graphics. You go into the boardroom, you want to show your pie charts and bar graphs and things like that. You can make beautiful overhead transparencies using a laser printer. Another example, technical documentation, engineering drawings. A lot of fine lines you have to reproduce. Anytime you're really trying to reproduce high-resolution graphics and hard copy, it's a good example of the use of a laser printer. Gary, we're going to take a look at the technology of laser printers today. We'll also look at some of the top laser printers on the market, including Apple's LaserWriter Plus, Hewlett Packard's LaserJet 2, and the Oki Data LaserLine 6. Now, we get all excited thinking about the 300 dots per inch resolution of today's laser printers. Well, there are new generation laser printers. We found one that prints at 1,200 dots per inch. It's from a company called Printware, and we found it in Sunnyvale, California. The novelty of desktop publishing has worn off for most PC users who are familiar by now with the page makeup software and laser printer look of company newsletters. But laser technology has some distinct limitations and in terms of resolution, it has yet to approach the quality of professional typesetting. Printware of St. Paul, Minnesota has found a way to break through the 300 dots per inch barrier by using a radically different optical system one that boosts resolution to 1,200 by 600 dots per inch. One of their first customers was Laser Friendly, a software company in Sunnyvale, California, that specializes in high-end desktop publishing software. It was important to us because we come from a professional printing background. Our software was developed out of that background in typography. And we also wanted, for instance, to produce our documentation with a high-resolution laser printer. The printware machine doesn't come cheap. Equipped with PostScript interpreter and two megabytes of memory, it retails for around $16,000. On the other hand, its closest competitor runs about $30,000. The printware fills a, a, a gap. I mean, for quite some time, professional typesetters and others have been saying that, uh, that the new laser printers are all very fine, but they're not the kind of resolution necessary for a lot of applications. And um, I think there was some attitude that there just wouldn't be such a laser printer, but now there is. Joining us in the studio now is Jim Gable, product manager at Apple for the LaserWriter Plus. And next to Jim is Roy Perry, general manager of LetraSet USA, the company that sells Ready, Set, Go. Gary? Jim, this looks more like a copier than it does a printer. <laughs> What's going on inside a laser printer? Well, it looks like a copier for a good reason. The actual printing engine is a copier. And the reason laser printers have become so popular and low cost is it was based on copier technology. Mm -hmm. What's going on inside it, though, is it's a copier that instead of having a glass plate and a document, it has a laser beam that goes back and forth. 
and the Macintosh tells it where to put that laser beam, when to turn it on and off, when you get 300 dots to the inch, and when, where those dots go. Mm -hmm. So it, it works like a copier from about here down. Okay. Here up is sort of where the magic is. Um, on the Apple printer, what really distinguishes it from other kinds of, of laser printers that you'll find is the flexibility that's built into that controller. The Macintosh is a very highly integrated system. And users of Macintoshes are not accustomed to stone walls. They like to be able to take their text and change it to a different face, make it bold, make it italics, drop a photograph here, take a business chart, put it in the middle of their letter, mix text and graphics with no worries. And that's what this printer allows you to do, because it has many typefaces built in with no limitations to what size it is, uh, whether you do it sideways or up and down, whether you uh, make it really large, whether you twist it. All that's capable in this mm -hmm. printer. So when a person on his Macintosh makes his document, he just says print, and he gets it out of here. And he doesn't have to load in a bunch of optional cards. He doesn't have to go buy some strange card for his printer. Uh, he doesn't have to have a Mac 2 instead of a Mac Plus. They all work the same, and they work off this. OK, okay now when, when buying uh, a Laser Writer Plus, I mean, mm -hmm. there are no choices, that's it. That's the box. And... There are two models, and the only difference between those two are different typefaces. Uh, fonts You're talking are about the laser writer and the laser writer plus. Laser writer and the plus, right? And the differences are just a number of typefaces that you have built into the computer, and the computer meaning this computer. Right, right. And really, the difference with with desktop laser printers, fonts have gotten to be kind of a uh, squirrely term. Fonts on a lot of laser printers um, mean courier in 12 point or courier bold. And if you want to do times bold, you have to go buy a cartridge. Or if you want to do your times in 14 point, you have to go buy another cartridge. Uh, printers might come with six or 15 fonts of that type. Mm -hmm. Ours isn't that type because every Times Roman, this printer has Times Roman in it, and every character can be printed from six to bigger than your page, uh, point size, and you can print Helvetica just the same. When we say you have Times in it, we mean you have it in all styles, all sizes. So if we use their nomenclature to say how many fonts I had in here, it'd be hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. So it's, it gets a little confusing. Can you show us what it looks like inside? Yeah. The difference here is that this is very much like desktop copiers work. And the printer from Apple has this removable toner cartridge. So when you run out of toner, instead of dumping in toner and getting it all over your office, you just buy this and snap it in. Also, oh, a lot is, of the, uh, Jim, what is the price of this? Uh, this is $100, $100, and it prints about 3,000 copies. OK. So it's about a little over three, 3 cents a copy for mm -hmm. the, the cartridge. And one of the benefits of this also is that a lot of the parts that wear out in copiers or printers are in this. So one of the reasons this is very reliable okay. is because all the parts are in here. Also, as I put it in and out, there are no delicate OPC drums, as they're called, exposed. So mm -hmm. I can't scratch it. I can't hurt it in any way. If I can turn to you, Roy, uh, with Ready, Set, Go, of course, that's a product in which people are going to be using laser printers as, as the output. Uh, could you, number one, print something out? You've got Ready, Set, Go in the, in the Mac over there, or maybe Jim can help us do that. Okay. And, and explain from a software user's point of view, if I went out and bought Ready, Set, Go, do I have to then have the Laser Writer Plus also to make this work? No, in fact, you don't. The, the beauty of Ready, Set, Go and working with Apple is that uh, Ready, Set, Go will output to any Apple printer, the Image Writer or the Laser Writer uh, or the Laser Writer Plus. The other beauty of Ready, Set, Go is that it will output to any PostScript compatible printer. Okay, can you explain what that means, the PostScript okay. compatible? All right, PostScript is a page description language mm -hmm. which uh, allows uh, complex text and graphics to be um, printed by a printer. And this is supported by the, the major printer manufacturers then for laser printers? It's supported by very many, yes, mm -hmm. okay. as well as many uh, people who would make typesetting equipment, such as uh, the Linotronic typesetting mm -hmm. equipment. Now, we're talking about the Mac world right now, and Ready, Set, Go is written for the Mac. I mean, what about the MS-DOS world in, ter in terms of doing these kinds of applications like Ready, Set, Go? Are you thinking about that? Well, we think about everything, Stuart. <laughs> uh, but, but our basic objective is to be the, the leader in graphic design software on the Macintosh. We are very, uh, very pleased with the, the, with the visual graphic interface of the Mac. Well, speaking of which, th there it is. Mm -hmm. How how would the quality differ now between what we just saw here and something that would come out, say, on an image writer? OK, this is at 300 dots per inch. An image writer would be at 72 dots per inch. And if someone chose to go to what is referred to as typesetting output, it could be 1,250 or 2,500 dots per inch. Depending on who the user is, 
and what he requires of his final document, different output qualities are satisfactory. Um, in many cases, the laser writer would be used as a proof source by a graphic designer, who then, once satisfied with this page, would have his final copy done in typesetter. Jim, Roy, thanks very much. We're going to move along and take a look now at HP's LaserJet 2 in just a minute, so stay with us. Joining us in the studio now is Steve Simpson, Group Marketing Manager with Hewlett Packard. And next to Steve is John Dickinson, Director of PC Labs at PC Magazine, where they've just reviewed 36 laser printers. Gary? Steve, I understand there are only a few manufacturers that actually build the inside insides of this thing, the engine. Uh, Rico, Canon, and I guess uh, several others. Uh, now, the last printer we saw, the Apple Laser Rider, has a Canon engine. And I understand this has a Canon engine also. Are we just buying something repackaged? No, we're not. Uh, what has happened, we, uh, like Apple, were both using what was known as a Canon CX print engine in our, in our previous, in our case, our previous products, which were the uh, initial LaserJet products. And we in Canon learned a lot from those products. And this is what we would consider to be a second generation print engine. This is the, based on the SX print engine. Canon and we went to a lot of trouble to uh, make some changes and make some improvements over its predecessor. A couple things being, for example, correct order output in printing as opposed to reverse collation, and a much darker print capability than its predecessors. Steve, what other things did you learn from the first LaserJet printer, and, and how is the LaserJet Plus better, or Series 2 better? I think the thing we learned, number one, was that we needed to make the products as easy to use as possible. And we've done that a couple of ways. First of all, we really focused very heavily on providing software support by working very closely with ISVs. So we have about 600 ISVs who support these products. But the other thing we had to do is we had to make the products very easy to set up, configure, and use, even if your software uh, package didn't support it particularly well. So we did a lot of effort in the front panel, for example. Now you can do all your configuration, even choosing which interface you use, et cetera, from the front panel. No more dip switches, because mm -hmm. those were a problem. Selection of which fonts I may want to print in. If my software package doesn't do that, I can do from the front panel. Uh, that was really, I think, the key emphasis, is make the products very easy to use and, uh, and continually improve the functionality and print quality. Steve, where do you see the uh, use of the laser printer in your business? I mean, your customers, what, do they look, what kind of a mix do you have? Well, we find that about 85% of our products are connected to MS-DOS, PC-DOS-based systems. So they're being used primarily in office environments, a uh, very large uh, pool of people, as we know. So we find that they're typically being used for office applications, which are typically word processing, spreadsheet applications, and those types of things. Though 10% of them, according to our users, are being used for desktop publishing through packages such as Aldous PageMaker or Ventura Publisher. But the primary emphasis is office application uh, use. John, would it be fair to say then, say the Apple Laser Writer we saw before is really more geared at the desktop publishing uh, situation on a Mac as opposed to the LaserJet, which is a, a sort of being used more likely as just a business printer? Well, just a business printer says a lot. I mean, the LaserJet is one standard, which has become very, very important, but out of, of the 36 printers that we tested here, many of them had several um, emulations in them, including HP LaserJet. 27 had HP LaserJet. 22 of them emulate the standard Diablos uh, 630 Daisy Wheel printer. Mm -hmm. And again, it's for the office automation market, for the word processing, the spreadsheet, the database. The big thing is, is that there's a lot of competition out there to get that market because those people are looking for high-speed, quiet printers that don't disrupt the office environment. Uh, John, you, you mentioned standards. What kind of standards are there in terms of hardware and software? Hey, we go out and buy these things. Can you be safe in buying a, a certain kinds of interfaces? Yeah, just about anything. Any laser printer out there right now will work with a PC, and many of them work, will work also with a Macintosh as well, because quite a few also emulate the PostScript language that the Apple Macintosh wants, and some of the PC-based um, desktop publishing systems also are looking for that. They also support this. So there's a couple of different standards that you can be getting, but it's almost certain that if your dealer tells you it'll hook up to the computer that you've got and the word processing or whatever it is that you've got, it'll do it. Mm -hmm. Steve, could you sort of have something uh, come out of the laser printer just so we can uh, be convinced it actually works here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, what I've done is I, I've just uh, sent a command uh, to uh, Microsoft Word to provide us a, an output. We, can, we note that uh, we're receiving data in the printer. You can see that by the flashing green light. While it, well, in fact, it's printing right now, uh, and this is a relatively simple document, uh, but it's typical of, of what many users are doing in office automation. 
And it's because we'll see multiple fonts, which before we were able, never able to do. And, uh, but, uh, you know, rel relatively straightforward output. Mm -hmm. Very clean. Very nice. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, of course, we have users who do want to do uh, desktop publishing mm -hmm. types of applications, as this print sample shows. Or they may want to do some type of documentation, as this one shows. But again, as I mentioned, uh, we find a, a very large number of our users are really focused on the office applications, but they want to make their document look better than the next guy down the block from them. John, there's a big difference in the price of an HP LaserJet and an Apple LaserWriter we saw before. What is the difference? What are you not getting because of the lower price with this one? Well, you're not getting an awful lot of software and processor that's required to run the PostScript language that the Apple LaserWriter is looking for. Um, you're also getting, uh, in the case of the LaserJet 2, you're getting a newer, smaller, less expensive to produce engine mm -hmm. that, it, again, has a lot of the engineering improvements come out in cost efficiency, and you'll see that in other engines, like the new Ricoh six-page a minute engine is quite a bit less expensive mm -hmm. than the old Canon engines were. So it's just a, a general um, increase in the efficiency of the manufacturing and the technology. Gentlemen, we're going to be back in just a minute. Now, laser printers have led to an entirely new business called the Laser Parlor, where if you don't want to buy a laser printer, you just bring your floppy disks into this place, and they'll print it out for you. You pay for the laser printer by the hour. Wendy Woods has a report on one such laser parlor here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Add a new word to your vocabulary, the Laser Parlor. Desktop publishing service centers such as the Krishna Copy Center in San Francisco and its eight franchises throughout the country are cashing in on the complexity and the high cost of desktop publishing with do-it-yourself desktop publishing equipment including high quality typesetters. People want to invest only two or three thousand dollars in a computer and have the capability of doing everything and a place like this gives them the, the missing links. We provide them with the Linotronic, which is very expensive, OCR. And for a lot of people, uh, laser printers are very expensive, so they can use laser printers on as-need basis rather than having to buy them and keep them on their desk all the time. With a little help from qualified staff members, anyone can desktop publish and turn out professional-looking copy. The cost is roughly half of what a professional typesetter would charge, and there's obviously more control over the final product. But the big question is, will this idea catch on with the rest of America? The trend is there, and I think it's only a matter of time that this is going to be a part and parcel of a business service. Until it does catch on, however, the photocopying arm of this business is still the laser parlor's bread and butter. So basically, in a matter of minutes and without any experience in laser printers, I managed to typeset and copy a document in a fraction of the time and the cost of a conventional print shop. In San Francisco, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us in the studio now is Charles Kapagan. Charles is Director of Product Marketing with Okie Data. And next to Charlie, back again, John Dickinson of PC Labs. John, in your test here in PC Magazine, you tested 36 laser printers, uh, two of them that you ranked very high that were low cost were the Okie Data and the Hill Packard LaserJet uh, Series 2. Why did you rank the um, Okie Data as high as you did? I have to look at the structure of the laser printer market before I can answer that question, and it's very simple to do. There are uh, printers set up for desktop publishing that normally include PostScript, like the Apple Laser Writer. Then you have another category that is the high end. Um, Really, they are uh, typesetting machines like mm -hmm. the Verityper, which do 1,200 dots per inch. Then you have a heavy-duty machine like the Genicom 5010, which are set up for large-scale network printing. And then you have the vast majority of printers, like the Okie Data, which are set up for desktop work in an office environment, for word processing, spreadsheets, and data database printouts. Mm -hmm. Most of those printers emulate the HP LaserJet, as a matter of fact. Many of them also emulate the Diablo 630 printer, and some also emulate the Epson or IBM Matrix printers. Among the best of those was the Oki data, largely because it does the HP emulation very effectively and it does it at a very attractive mm -hmm. price. Okay. okay, Charlie, you got rated very high in this PC Labs test. <clears throat> Tell us about the Laser Line 6. Why is it so good? Well, we designed this product not only for the desktop publishing market, but more specifically for desktop presentation. Maybe a subtle difference, but we find most of the users of this class machine want merged text and graphics, want multiple fonts, want large type fonts, and I'll show that with you with our self-test mm -hmm. message as it'll come out of the laser here. But really, 
can't afford and are impossible to be trained on the true publishing aspects of this industry. I think the, the publishing packages, I don't want to uh, demean Aldous and those, they're fine, but they're for a very narrow segment of the market. We designed this product with superior features against products costing much more. And I'd like to show you one of these when the self-test message comes over, and that's the 15 resident fonts in the machine. Most of the competitors have three or seven. Mm -hmm. This machine comes with 15 standard. And uh, it's also got the optional font cartridge, so in the self-test message, you'll get a good idea of the number of fonts available in the machine. And this is what people want to do with these machines. Charlie, you got a couple other things here in front of you. What, what for example, is, is this little baby? This is our three-port interface. Um, this is, as John had mentioned, we are HP uh, Plus compatible, and this particular product allows us to interface to three different uh, workstations or host. Uh, it results in a price of $2,395 for the product, or $2,400, and results in the per user cost of $800, or the price of a serial impact dot matrix mm -hmm, printer. Mm -hmm. And you have both serial and parallel interfaces serial as Serial well. and parallel, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. now, what about this? What do you have here? Okay, another... Um, concern we had with in trying to make this machine the best machine for desktop presentation was recognizing the migration of the users really going to be dot matrix and daisy wheel users that were going to come into the laser. Well, we have HP LaserJet Plus for those that had LaserJet compatible drivers, but for all those dot matrix and daisy wheel products, this little piece of software um, provides instant compatibility for those, so there's no software changes yeah. required. Is that provided with the uh, machine? That's free. Well? It's $150 okay. software value free with the machine. Okay, now also just to get an idea of what it costs for these font cartridges, uh, here you have the, what, 15 uh, typefaces? 15 or? standard, yes. Okay, and then when the additional cartridge gives this you is, uh, This is one cartridge, just at the Times Roman cartridge, and it's installed in the machine right now, and that's about $149. Okay. There's mm -hmm. four or five of those available right now. Charlie, about 15 seconds left. We have another Oki data set up over there with a little box under it. What's that? This is our new 550-sheet second tray. This gives the user the c capability of installing letter or legal size paper and having a wide range of flexibility mm -hmm. on his paper input. John, uh, price is going to come down on laser printers still? Or well, are we the, at the bottom? The price is going to go down, but the end's going to go up, so it's a little hard to say where it's going to wind up. We're under $2,000 now and sort of still going down, but it really will depend on the end. That's our look at laser printers. Thanks for being with us. Hope we'll see you again next week on the Computer Chronicles. In the random access file this week, PS2 clones may be out there now, but it's not clear that anyone will be able to buy them. Computerland has announced that it will not carry PS2 clones unless the manufacturer agrees to indemnify it in the event of a lawsuit by IBM. If other retail chains also insist on PS2 clone insurance, the added cost of the indemnities plus the license fees to IBM could take away much of the price advantage for the clones. The fuzzy legal issue is still casting a cloud over the future of PS2 clone business, though of course Tandy, with its Model 80 clone, doesn't have to worry about deals with other retailers. Lotus has released its 123 value pack. The $15 package lets you remove the copy protection from 123. It also provides some other enhancements, such as limited recalculation, a learn mode, and compatibility with laser printers and the newer EGA and VGA monitors. Hewlett Packard says if you're having trouble with a zapped laser printer, it may be your RS-232 cable. HP says the RS-232 cables have a high impedance and can act like antennas, picking up static charges which can damage chips. HP says if you're using more than 50 feet of cable, you are a candidate for static charge damage. The IRS says it's delighted with the growing experiment in online filing. The Fed say nearly 600,000 taxpayers filed online this year, leading to faster refunds and fewer mistakes. A New York consulting firm says one of the fastest growing segments of the PC market is voice messaging. Voice boards for PCs are now available for about $200. The study says voicemail finally solves the problem of telephone tag, and the study says that even without the problem of telephone tag, phone calls are often inefficient, citing a study which says that two-thirds of all phone calls are less important than the work they interrupt. Time for a welcome interruption from Paul Schindler with this week's software review. Oops, time to do my review. There are dozens of programs on the market to help manage your time. The problem with some is that they're passive. If you don't remember to look at them, you'll miss your appointments. You have to remember to remember. 
Other programs do a lot, but are so complex they wind up being too much work to maintain. Smart Alarms handles both objections. Smart Alarms is a Macintosh desk accessory, so it can display a message on the screen anytime, regardless of what else you may be doing with your system. Like this. You can then tell Smart Alarms you've dealt with the activity or that you want another reminder and when you want it. If you do nothing, Smart Alarms politely bongs at you every so often until you tell it what to do. It's a bit of a nag, but you're the one who wanted to remember the event in the first place, right? Dead simple and more effective than any other time management system. Smart Alarms for the Apple Macintosh, $50 from Imagine Software in Fairfax, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Laptop portable computers must really be coming into their own now. Not only are there computer magazines devoted to laptops, but there is now a computer show devoted to laptops. It's called Laptop 88, and it'll be held on June 7th and 8th in New York. More than 50 exhibitors will be present with hardware, software, and peripherals just for the laptop user. Molecular biologists at MIT have reported the discovery of a new second genetic code in living cells. The code keeps track of the type and position of a molecule in a larger molecular structure. The man who discovered the code, Professor Paul Schimmel, says the logic of it is simple, powerful, and profound, and could provide the basis for a new computer language. Finally, the software game market seems to be alive and well. The Japanese company Nintendo is king of the mountain right now. Its recent release of Dragon Quest III sold out its entire one million unit shipment in one day. The trade publication Soft Letter said that caused what was probably the biggest single day of school truancy in the history of American schools. That's it for this week's Random Access. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Transcripts of the Computer Chronicles are available online on CompuServe. Type Go Chronicles at any CompuServe prompt. If you'd like the CompuServe access number in your area or a free booklet describing how to use online services, call 1-800-848-8199.